Hi, Dr. Giovanni Rondo with Healthy Mind, Body, and Spirit. We're in season three, and this is episode five. And we're going to talk today with Dr. Mark Jurich, and he's going to talk with us about addiction, what that's all about, and the things that we can do to help our community. Welcome, Dr. Jurich, and tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into addiction medicine. Thank you, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, I am from New York originally, okay. but have become a Southerner, a Kentuckian, uh, for the past, oh, 40 years or so. Um, got into addiction in medical school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think as many of us experience, addiction is just prevalent throughout our society, throughout our communities, and it hits e probably everyone in every family. And, and with that, um, I, I think that was my motivation, just seeing it up close had some training while I was in medical school, um, finished uh, residency in internal medicine, and that's the practice that I had for many, many years. But I always kept myself alive, if you will, with addiction. And so for the past 30 years, and it has grown to where I now only do addiction medicine, um, I, I stand here now. Wow, wow. So it sounds like we did a little bit like a flip-flop. I was born and raised here, <laughs> in in Kentucky and then I went up to New York for my residency so kind of did a little difference but we're both here now so yes. trying to help our community overall so can you talk a little bit more about the actual definition of addiction and then I think a lot of times we think of addiction as just being you know certain illicit substances but just addiction in just the most general sense yeah I think that's really really very important um, you know uh, we talk about addiction and we talk about dependency. Um, if you go to the strictest definition, uh, what we call the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, mm -hmm. version 5, um, is, is a psychiatric manual that identifies, and, and I think that's interesting too, all psychiatric diagnoses. And, and addiction was cast into the psychiatric mm. realm. Substance use disorders and a variety of substance use disorders, whether you're talking about opioids, stimulants, uh, uh, sedative hypnotics, cannabis, tobacco, alcohol, uh, are all defined uh, within the DSM. And typically it has to do with tolerance, medic substances that will produce tolerance substances that will elicit a withdrawal, but also, and, and ju just to keep it as simple as possible, people who are diagnosed with substance use disorders continue to use in spite of consequences of that substance use, and it enters into all aspects of their life. Uh, we consider this a biopsychosocial disease, biologically, medically, so from a physical standpoint, from an emotional standpoint, the psycho, but social also. Uh, the fact that it affects relationships, family, marital, uh, it affects work, it affects uh, uh, criminal justice, and, and behaviors in, in general. We try to distinguish between addiction and dependency. Dependence is something that would happen to all of us if we use these substances. Use it long enough, you will develop tolerance to that substance, you will develop withdrawal if you stopped using it. But addiction is more related to the behaviors that are attached to, do people continue to use in spite of consequences? Do they start using more and more to get the kinds of effects that they want to do? Does it change what they would do as a normal, rational person as far as their behaviors go? I see. So the dependence, is that more of a phys physical a manifestation more of a you know overall or is it also more psychological or both no the the dependence is purely physical, physical. that mm -hmm. uh, you know if you, if you think about addiction and who is an individual who can get addicted um, we typically will talk about a genetic component as mm -hmm. well as a developed component and we usually like to separate that out 50 50 um, mm -hmm. but 
I think that anybody, even without that genetic component, definitely can, will develop dependence with continued use of a substance. And it doesn't take all that long. It really, in, in some situations, can happen within weeks of using a, mm. a substance. So we think about people who are going into the hospital with pain syndromes. Uh, okay. They get surgery, and of course they're going to have pain. Yeah. Extended yeah. use of those, will people will develop dependence. They won't necessarily develop addiction. Addiction, okay. I see. Okay. So you mentioned the genetic components. So you see that in families. Yes, definitely okay. so. Okay. You, and, and, and so the risk is much higher if there is a genetic component within your family. Okay. So if you see someone, you know, that comes into the office and they, you know, talk about, you know, their mom or their parents or whatnot, that would, you know, that have uh, issues of addiction or dependency, um, that bodes not as well for them. Is that what you're saying, basically? Yes, it, it definitely was and needs to be cautioned. So we as parents need to, mm -hmm. if we understand that there is, uh, there are substance use disorders in our families, uh, particularly mm -hmm. mother, father, parent, mm -hmm. What do we do with our children? How, you know, how, how do we guide them? And mm -hmm. you know, our, our children are exposed. They're out there. The substances, fortunately or unfortunately, are are out there. Um, and the best that we can really do is to educate our children about substance mm -hmm. use disorders. What are the ramifications? What are the you know the endpoints of continued use? And they're going to need to use their best judgment because they will have uh, access to these mm. substances. And yeah. they need to understand if I use my risk is that much higher because mother or father or grandfather right. actually had a substance use disorder. Wow, that's pretty fascinating. Yeah. I'm sorry, so also we mentioned different substances, but some people talk about food. You know, you can have a food addiction, but this, you know, we all, we all need food, but does that really, is that really a thing in terms of addiction to food? Yeah, it, it really is. We can extend the, you know, the definition or the exposure to, we can talk about food, you can talk about caffeine as mm. as an addiction and oh, yeah. that actually is a DSM mm -hmm. both of those are, are DSM diagnoses so I, I think any kind of behavior whether it be substance use or eating um, that people continue in spite of consequences um, they don't see what is developing as a result of that continued use and, and whatever drives that use. Now, you know, with addictions, with substance use disorders, it's the reward system that uh, leads to continued use. Um, because we sort of, we like to talk about hijacking the reward system. Uh, we have an area in the brain called the reward system, driven by dopamine. Uh, I'm sure many of your listeners and viewers have, have, have heard of that, that all substances of misuse, but other kinds of behaviors, whether it be food or sex or otherwise, really stimulate this reward center. Does gambling? And gamb reason. gambling does, gambling does, does as well, that, yeah. yeah. And um, it stimulates that reward system, so you get dopamine output, and it feels good. Now, what's really interesting is that it feels good, but for some people with that genetic component, it mm. really feels good. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, t you know, it's just that first exposure, perhaps, mm -hmm. that this is good, I can continue to use, I like it, and they're off to the races with, with continued use. And then, you know, the reward is all so important to them that they ignore what else may be happening. But in terms of hijacking that reward system, you're developing a certain tolerance, the dopamine output diminishes over time, you mm -hmm. need to use more substance to get the to same, get same effect. effect. And yeah. when you see people in the more severe aspects of their substance use, for the most part, they're not necessarily using to get that reward. That is diminished so much. I, I still feel that there is still, still some reward, but they're using it just to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. That is, if they didn't have it, they would go into withdrawal. And withdrawal is horrible. It, it, it truly is. Uh, you do not want to punish anybody by going mm -hmm. through w withdrawal. So the 
person themselves who is using will go and seek drug and they will go to all extents to find that drug. Their whole life mm. gets taken over. They wake up in the morning, you, they've just been sleeping. Well, they're in withdrawal at that point. Within mm -hmm. eight hours, you're, you're really experiencing early withdrawal and they are planning their day to find that substance and use it throughout the day uh, in, in order to stay healthy. Wow. So is there actual genetic testing that you can do that, you know, you can see whether someone is going to be more predisposed? That, is, that that, is that a thing yet? It, it, definitely, it definitely is. Mm -hmm. The science is not so well developed mm -hmm. to be able to look at your genetic makeup and, and okay. say that you are at more risk. But there definitely are, you know, there aren't that many diseases that are single gene related, mm -hmm. that it's just one mutation that results in development of a disease. And in terms of this brain disease of addiction, it's multiple genes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's hard to put together. Okay. So particularly for our community, the African-American community, just looking at addiction overall, could you talk about that in terms of what we see in the African-American community? And then in terms of statistics overall with okay. addiction. Um, we see some differences in substance of choice um, in, in different ethnicities. Um, back in the 80s, cocaine and crack were big. We actually, it actually died out a little bit, but it's coming back. Mm. And that was definitely, and, and I can't give you reason for it, but that was something that was very prominent in the African-American mm. uh, community. Some oh. people would even say that, that there's been an intentional kind of thing when it comes to putting, you know, crack or, you know, certain substances within the African-American community. Yeah, I, again, I, I don't know the answer, whether it, there's a genetic component mm -hmm. to that, what, what, you know, what, what the reward system is doing as a result of, mm -hmm. but there just is, has been that association. Um, and opioids, heroin and, and then the oral um, synthetics of hydrocodone, oxycodone, okay. always seemed to be a, a white disease. Um, mm. Didn't see, as a matter of fact, when I first started working with clinics, and, and you know, the work that I do now is, is with the methadone clinic, mm -hmm. um, we easily had 60% plus were white, Caucasian, many fewer African Americans. Mm. But that's changing a little bit. Uh, again, I can't give you a good reason for that but we still see a lot of stimulant use, particularly cocaine, crack coming back. Meth, meth I see more in the white population than I mm -hmm. see in the African-American population. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But again, this is a disease that will affect everyone. And so how does it develop? Well, you've got that genetic component. What are the mm -hmm. social, factors social factors that, yeah, that result? Yeah. And um, you know whether it's black, white, or Otherwise, we definitely see a lower socioeconomic. We, we can talk about um, ACE, uh, adverse childhood experiences, experiences. Okay. and, uh, and uh, prone then to addictions. And adverse mm -hmm. childhood experiences relate to s growing up single parent, traumas during uh, uh, develop adolescence and development, exposure to, to substances, parents who use, uh, economic issues, a, a variety of things. And abuse? We, uh, so abuse, abuse those, kind of, those kind of yeah. traumas, whether it be verbal, sexual, or otherwise mm -hmm. abuse. Those mount up, and particularly in exposure to the adolescent, um, it has much more impact because we look at the adolescent brain as a plastic. Think about, um, mm -hmm. oh, what was, what's that? plastic ball that you that you bounce up and down uh it's before your time the uh, plastic ball that you bounce up and down yeah the well we, we talk about the plasticity mm -hmm. of the brain that it's forming and actually you know the brain is developing even through the mid-20s and exposure to these kinds of traumas mm. but also exposure to substances mm. really has a major impact on the brain and can lead to then we know that the likelihood of uh, addiction in somebody who has experienced six plus childhood experiences is quite high.
Oh, wow. So, so again, you know, if we are looking at, at a population that is, oh, maybe subjugated isn't a, the, the proper word for it, but ha has had its limitations and hasn't had mm -hmm. the, the capabilities to uh, climb out of these socioeconomic holes, they're very prone to addictions. Wow. Whew, that's a lot. That's a lot, you know, just to, to, to talk about and to, to discuss. And so um, we will be right back um, with more on addiction with Dr. Mark Jurich on the healthy mind, body, and spirit. Hi, Dr. Giovanni Rondo with another episode of Healthy Mind, Body, and Spirit. Our next show is going to be talking about my business called Global MD and direct primary care for our community. We have uh, someone who's gonna be asking a lot of questions. Her name is Gigi. She's gonna be asking a lot of questions of Global MD, and you're gonna be able to find out lots of good information. So stay tuned to Healthy Mind, Body, and Spirit. Thanks and be well. Hi, Dr. Giovanni Rondo back with Dr. Mark Jurich talking about addiction specifically in our community. So we were, Dr. George was just talking about uh, ACE or adverse childhood experiences that could actually uh, cause people to be more prone to addiction and, and dependency. So can you talk a little bit more about that, some of the, the adverse childhood experiences and how that can lead? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, it, it, we're, we're talking about addiction now as a brain disease. It, it's been very interesting to me, I've been at this a, a long enough time, that uh, we really, back in those earlier days, the 90s, didn't have a real understanding of the biology of this. Mm -hmm. I think we made a lot of good interpretations of what we saw, but we just really didn't have a basis to it. So you asked earlier about the genetics and have we identified specific genes, and there are some, but it's, it's multi-genetic uh, multi with mm -hmm. uh, uh, many influences th throughout our, our DNA. Um, Take it back to me. Mm -hmm. So just in terms of uh, the childhood experiences, yes. but then also just uh, overall, just the things that are going on uh, in our world, like, you know, we're still unfortunately in this pandemic, you know, and how that plays a role with addiction and dependency. Yeah, so the childhood experience and those traumas, we, we look at this brain disease, as I've mentioned, the reward system, and what has an impact on, on the reward system. Uh, the reward system wears out, mm -hmm. and so people need to use more, but there are other influences on that reward system, and we really are very, very closely looking at the biology of stress. Stress, And yes. that how that yes. diminishes the effect that anybody will get from the reward center, so mm -hmm. even without the genetics, if stressors are so intense mm -hmm. that uh, it, it will diminish reward. And we hear people oftentimes saying, I'm self-medicating, mm -hmm. that uh, the only thing that makes me feel better are these drugs because I'm just, they're not saying I'm not getting the dopamine, but that's mm -hmm. exactly what they are experiencing. The childhood experiences uh, definitely lead to that. Mm -hmm. The adolescent brain, so the exposure early on to some of these stressors really has a, a major impact on, again, the formation, the connections, the neural connections in the brain. So by what age does that connection, is, is it like mid-20s? Um, does, is that connection more solid and not as fluid? It's not as fluid, uh, mid-20s. Okay. But, and I think this is actually some good news is that it still can be changed over time mm -hmm. even after mid-twenties. Now the good news about that is, okay, you now have an addicted brain. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you do with that mm -hmm. addicted brain? Mm -hmm. And perhaps we can get into talking about some of the medication approaches to that. Um, but can you develop, can you return to, if a person gets into treatment, to the normalcy of what mm -hmm. the brain was before it was before impacted all that, by, yeah. by all of these influences? And nobody has a real secure answer with that, most would say that, yes, there will be some normalization. You can redevelop some of those new, uh, older, and, and as well, perhaps even newer connections. 
but it takes time. Yeah, and, and it's all pretty much within the brain in and yeah. of itself. And, th and that's why we talk about the brain, you know, as a brain disease. Mm -hmm. So over the years, the science has developed to really give us a much better understanding of this biology to be able to cause, call it a, a, a disease. You can mm -hmm. say diabetes is a result of ineffective mm -hmm. insulin. Mm -hmm. Well, now we can talk about this brain disease as inadequate dopamine, but multiple pieces of that have to mm -hmm. be put together you said that so well. There's so much stigma to uh, addiction. Um, but I think if we look at it as the a brain disease, just like you were saying, diabetes um, is a disease of the pancreas and, and, and how well we metabolize sugar. The same thing with, you know, addiction, you know, just making it um, less, you know, st stigmatized by just, you know, addressing the basis of it and that there's some issues within the brain chemistry. Just yes, overall. I think that's very important. Too many people consider it a um, a moral, a, a moral mm -hmm. failing, yeah. uh, a matter of choice, and it, mm -hmm. it really, perhaps there was some influence of that early on, not mm -hmm. so much the moral failing, but the choice, mm -hmm. but very soon after some use, and you know, as I've said, pe the substances are out there. Mm -hmm. Kids are willing to experiment. Yeah. They're self-medicating. They're in that experimentation phase right. of their lives, and yeah. some people are always into, you know, experimentation. So yes. yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, I just had a question in terms of um, how stress plays a role on the dopamine because it's, that's the reward. So. so <clears throat> Does it deaden the dopamine levels? Does it decrease? Tell me, can it, you explain that? Well, well it does. It, it yeah. diminishes the dopamine response. Mm -hmm. And again, that is pure biology. We're mm -hmm. talking about neurobiology mm -hmm. and neurohormones. Um, if you think about, let's take the substance methamphetamine or okay. cocaine. When somebody uses methamphetamine or cocaine, basically, you take it, it goes right to that reward center and effects a dopamine response directly, N nothing right. in between. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Many of the other substances though, sort of, it, it, it's secondary tertiary even to get to that reward center. There are interneurons and other mm -hmm. chemicals, gamma aminobutyric mm -hmm. acid, GABA, mm -hmm. um, serotonin, mm -hmm. all play a role in this. And so when you talk about opioids, mm -hmm. it's not directly into the reward center, but it's having an effect in another place. But the meth methamphetamines and the cocaine go directly. Directly And then there's certain uh, things that you do that can cause it to go directly also, or smoking it or inhaling it, um, much more so than in other ways or ingesting? I think really it's just the stimulants that mm -hmm. are going to go directly mm -hmm. there. The And so when we're talking about treatments and, and development of treatments, we can think about, all right, what can we do right at that reward center mm -hmm. um, to improve the dopamine response or block the effect of cocaine mm -hmm. and, and amphetamine, methamphetamine and other stimulants in that area. But we have the advantage if there are other areas and other neurohormones mm -hmm. uh, to be able to block those effects, those negative effects from use of the substance in other areas of the brain. Okay. okay. Wow, that's just really fascinating. So we've talked about, um, you know, just what it is, you know, in terms of, you know, addiction and then the, dif the differences with um, uh, dependency and also talking about with, you know, as we grow and as our body chemistry changes. Um, but can we talk a little bit about treatment, you know, and things that we can do to try to help um, someone who is having issues with addiction? Um, I know we have community resources and different programs, but, you know, can you kind of elucidate that a little bit yes. more? Um, again, another fortunate event is that, um, you know, treatment works. Mm -hmm. Treatment typically includes a combination of medication along with behavioral change. So mm -hmm. all the counseling and therapy and support groups are really very important to this. There are several areas we, we can talk about. Um, we can talk about harm reduction. Mm -hmm. So treatment in harm reduction probably doesn't or doesn't have to include that behavioral response. We can, we can think about syringe service programs. 
what are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to make people not die, live longer, live healthier. Uh, are we sad? Do we need 100% improvement or do, do we need partial improvement? What benefits is successful treatment? And we know that syringe service programs, um, providing paraphernalia, needles, mm -hmm prevents a lot of other disease related to addiction. So you're just talking also about the uh, syringe exchange syringe, uh, programs. Yeah, yeah. So kind and of, I call it syringe of. service programs because yes, they have syringe exchange, but I also, and I know that our program here in Louisville does that, provides information. It's all voluntary, mm -hmm. so if a person comes in there looking for syringes, they are offered the ability to talk with a counselor, get referrals if necessary, but mm -hmm. if they just want to pick up syringes, that's okay also, okay. But, it, but it is entree if, uh, in, in some situations. Okay. Real interesting, and this happened very, very recently, you will start hearing about self-injection clinics. This is something that has been in Europe, a little bit in Canada, but New York opened up the first self-injection clinic. Mm. This also is a part of harm reduction. We don't want people dying. So people will come into the clinic and will inject in, you know, with counselors and, and uh, other people there in order to prevent overdoses. The substances that are being used out there are just outrageous. Most people don't really even know what they Some are the using. That they're, yeah. You know, yeah. opioids are very high on the list. Again, I'll, I'll repeat opioids are um, heroin and morphine and oxycodone and hydrocodone. And now we hear everything about fentanyl and that has been the real mm -hmm. problem. Yeah, that's what I was just about to ask. You know, in terms of just seeing fentanyl um, within our community and hearing about a lot of fentanyl overdoses, what, what is that all about? In terms of fentanyl is such a potent opioid, uh, you know, 50 to even 100 percent, and there are multiple kinds of fentanyl if you look at it chemically. Mm. Um, the people who are producing this are unfortunately great chemists, and they're trying to make a great product. Mm. I mean, that's business is business. Mm. They are also manufacturing fentanyl and selling it mixed with a multitude of other substances. Many of my patients say, but I didn't use cocaine. Well, your screen was positive because it was mixed with, or meth, or benzos like Valium and Xanax, all to make a better product, but also putting the patient who is using at very high risk of overdose, and that's what we've seen. So it's basically trying to make more customers or trying to make I, more I satisfied so. customers? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Wow. What can we do to counteract that? Education, <sighs> education, education. Yeah. Um, what else? Yeah, there, there's, you know, uh, surely the criminal justice system, you know, is acting, needs to continue to mm -hmm. act. We need to prevent the supply from, mm -hmm. from coming in. We need to prevent uh, the sales. We need to do prevention uh, mm -hmm. from, with kids and families and in, in schools and, and in churches and in other houses, mm -hmm. houses of worship. Um, we need to improve the situation of the people who are at risk of yeah. using those social determinants exactly that are so the poverty and exactly the all of yeah. that mm -hmm. but we also need to recognize that there are medications and we need to use the medications much more than than we have in the past we're very fortunate when we think about opioids there are a number of medications uh, Viewers may be familiar with methadone, may be familiar with buprenorphine or suboxone, with naltrexone or, or Vivitrol. We're very fortunate with alcohol use disorder that there are multiple medications to be able to help treat that. With um, tobacco use, there are medications. And my feeling is even though we don't have medications now that are well proven for treatment of cocaine use, mm -hmm. uh, stimu any stimulant use, um, and, and a variety of so hallucinogens and others, I think that the end point of all this is we will understand the science much better in the future and there will be medications. The NIH has been working on these things for years using medications that we currently have uh, you know, in our pharmacy that can be used for other purposes but also in development of new medications. Okay. So hopefully something will come about in yeah. terms of helping to treat people who have issues with cocaine uh, abuse 
like what we have for opioid yes. uh, use also. And you mentioned something a little bit earlier in terms of the criminal justice system. Um, one of the things that mm -hmm. I've heard about is just really decriminalizing um, just substance abuse and, and or substance use, I should say. Um, can you talk a little yeah. bit more about that and also just in terms of the use of you know marijuana and, and other substances in the medical field? There are, you know, there, there are some behaviors that just, if you will, can't go unpunished that do require the criminal justice system to act. Mm -hmm. They have to. But in general, it doesn't help the individual who has a substance use disorder and is using, and unfortunately some of those behaviors associated with it, it doesn't help the community to put them in jail. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there are concerns about legalization, about incarceration, about making better access to treatment. Mm -hmm. Many of our patients enter the system in, from a variety of points. Criminal justice system is really high on that. Mm -hmm. uh, um, physician offices, so we need that mm -hmm. kind of education mm -hmm. through all to, to recognize that this is a person with a problem, with a disease that needs treatment and to direct them to treatment surely better than incarceration. Okay, so more rehabilitation and more education on the front end. Yes. You know, more upstream. And then, we, you know, and then, you know, you get into aspects of, of harm reduction. Mm -hmm. um, we truly do know that, particularly for opioid use disorder, if uh, you put somebody on medication, and medications work best. There are different ways of treating opioid use disorder and different medications mm -hmm. to use, but we know medications work best. And just being on that medication, life is better. And if life mm -hmm. is better, probably the community benefits. Mm -hmm. Now, it may not meet the expectations of you or me or somebody else out there, mm -hmm. but if they're not injecting every day, mm -hmm. if they're not using every day, things do get better and they are at less risk and, and therefore the mm -hmm. community benefits. So it's that individual, it's an indi on an individual basis in terms of how right. someone so is. So we need to provide access to treatment for, for people who are willing to go the distance mm -hmm. and, and really rebuild their lives or if some people just want, you know, minimal improvements, um, uh, they don't have the money, they're robbing and stealing because that's the only way they can afford their, their drug. If we can, you know, well, providing the, the drug is, is a whole other story, but uh, if we can get them on medications, um, that is the first thing that we see. My patients just breathe a tremendous sigh of relief mm -hmm. when they start in a methadone program and they're not waking up in the morning thinking, I gotta go and figure out how to get my drug mm -hmm. today. Right, right. So in terms of uh, overdoses, we also have a substance called Narcan um, that we utilize to kind of help. Can you explain that if, in case someone, you know, has access to it or, or, you know, just how that's utilized? Yeah. Well, we've talked about the brain and, uh, you know, these substances going to the brain and um, the opioids like heroin and fentanyl stimulate a receptor a, a lock and a key, uh, they stimulate the receptor to provide a response. And when you use too much of it, part of that response is not just the reward, but you know, overdose is a result of respiratory depression. You stop breathing and a variety of other things will happen and people die. So those medications like methadone and suboxone are agonist medications. They fit into, but they don't have the same kind of effect that heroin and fentanyl have, but they have some effect and it makes people feel comfortable. They don't go in withdrawal. They don't crave. Mm -hmm. It's not a real reward experience. But then there's medication called Narcan. So that is called an antagonist. It is also that key that goes into the lock, but it has absolutely no effect. As a matter of fact, all that fentanyl that created the overdose is kicked off. Mm. So the respiratory depression goes away. People can breathe. They feel horrible. They're thrown immediately into withdrawal, but that better than dying than from dying. not okay. breathing. Okay. So there is like kind of like a treatment 
but it has to be administered immediately. Has to be yeah. admi mm -hmm. administered immediately. Um, you know, we in the field all need to have access to Narcan. Mm -hmm. I have some in my car mm -hmm. um, at treatment centers. Every patient needs to be offered. Patients' family need to be offered. But as a citizen on the street, mm -hmm. um, you know, and particularly since we've also said, well, we all are exposed to substance use. We right. all have somebody in, right. in our realm that it would be worthwhile having Narcan, and it is available. I mean, the health department will make that available. Pharmacies will make that available without a prescription. Okay, great. This is just wonderful information um, about a pretty difficult topic, so thank you so much, Dr. Jurich. Before we, we go, um, on the Healthy Mind, Body, and Spirit show, we always like to talk about what we as physicians and clinicians do to keep ourselves, to, to heal ourselves and to keep ourselves as healthy as we possibly can. So what do you do, Dr. Jerry? Oh, Jurich, you're putting me healthy? on the spot yeah, now. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you're on the I, examining table. <laughs> I like to think that, that I do take care of myself. Okay. Um, we'll pass over diet, which is really mm -hmm. very important. Again, I talk to my patients a lot, what I call complementary alternative medicine. Ta it is taking care of mm -hmm. mind, body, mm -hmm. and That's spirit. Good. So a healthy diet, uh, yeah, we shouldn't eat all the sugar that we <laughs> eat. And there are things like alcohol, <laughs> which, you know, it is a legal substance and, and can be used socially, but um, some precautions with that. And obesity is a terrible epidemic mm -hmm. also. Exercise, crucial. I exercise very regularly. Mm -hmm. I love my exercise. Mm -hmm. It actually is a mental process for me as well. Mm -hmm. uh, think Doesn't about, that increase your dopamine? Think about the runner's okay. high, and yes, I definitely yes. know that mm -hmm. it increases my, my dopamine. Okay, um, okay. And then just, I, I like to relax. I have my support systems. I have my folks that I can talk to and spend some downtime with, and mm -hmm. it's important to keep that as a daily part of my life. Okay. And are those things that you advise your patients, like if they're, you know, dealing with, you know, not just addiction and dependency, but just overall life issues, are those things that you advise, like having someone to talk to, doing the exercise, things like that? Crucial. Mm -hmm. Bring back to the addiction field, you know, the social process. Or bring back to COVID. I mean, what has COVID mm. done to us? And definitely yes. there's much more substance use during these COVID days. Mm. And I think the intrusion on our social process has played a, a big role in that. Mm. So, so the isolation yes. just really hasn't been great for us mentally. So that could, because this is a, you know, addiction is a, you know, potentially a mental issue. Yes. Um, think about the stressors related mm -hmm. to the, stress, the yes. mothers who work, but have to be home for the, mm -hmm. because their kids were at school. Schedules need to be changed. Mm -hmm. uh, lost your job and finances are affected. Yeah. All of that. There is a lot. There's a lot going on. But thank you so much. You have just really been a great source of information for us on the Healthy Mind, Body, and Spirit show. Thank you for joining thank us, you. Dr. Jurich. So thank you for joining us for the Healthy Mind, Body, and Spirit show where our focus is to improve the entire world, but with its particular focus or um, relevance to the African-American community. Thank you and be well.